Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, to you today. It's really a great pleasure. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you about the tumor immune microenvironment, and this is an area where we certainly need a lot of help from quantitative people to uh, f figure all of this out. So these are my disclosures. So immunotherapy has certainly come quite a long way. I love this headline, I think it's from uh, 1908. Many cases cured here, probably 150 sure cures. And I'm wondering if 100 years from now, people will look back at what we're doing today and think the same things about us. And I'm hoping so, because that means we'll be continuing to make progress. But this is the root of immunotherapy, or one of them, a surgeon in the Lower East Side of New York decided back in the uh, 19th century that it was perhaps a good idea to inject his cancer patients' tumors with bacteria. This was a very brave approach in the area before antibiotics, but he did claim, as shown, to have cured some people. So, of course, immunotherapy has centered around melanoma, although hopefully in the future it will not, and we'll be seeing great things in, in other cancers. Well, we already are, but that it, the rates of responses will improve in other cancers. But I think this is, this is very striking, and this illustrates just how far we have come. So this is an article from 1999, and this, this is state-of-the-art therapy back then. And you can imagine, as a physician, seeing a patient in your room. And melanoma patients are very healthy until a couple weeks before they die, so they look great. And you're telling this person, well, this is what we expect for you. And um, so chemotherapy certainly prolongs life, perhaps by a few months, but it's, it's extremely ineffective <coughs> and cures virtually no melanoma patients. This is what we have today. So it's really been an amazing change and just a, a real joy to uh, be in the field at this time where we actually have immunotherapies, in this case, checkpoint blockade. And you can see that not only are a significant portion of people responding to these therapies, but there's also a significant fraction that appear to be long-term responders. And the latest data uh, regarding responders to anti-PD-1 shows that 35% of people are still alive at five years, which is incredible compared to where we came from. So obviously, immunotherapy is incredibly different, as the speakers before me explained. And I, I think it's quite clear that the mechanism of action is very, very different from chemotherapy, which makes it very complicated for us as oncologists to give at times, but chemotherapy is directly toxic. It works using standard kinetics. If the patient's tumor isn't shrinking, you're in trouble, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, immunotherapy is a bit more indirect. It activates the immune system. The immune system might signal around with various cells for a period of time, then eventually decide, oh, it's time to go after the cancer. And so you can have delayed responses. You can have uh, situations where the tumor can even get swollen with immune cells due to inflammation, which can lead to confusing results on scans. Of course, we're always weighing cancer versus autoimmunity, and our bodies evolved to keep in that balance. And so what we're really trying to do with our therapies is perhaps crudely to move things more towards the autoimmunity spectrum at this point, because although some of the T cell talks showed incredible and great specificity, most of our melanoma patients, our solid tumor patients, we're really giving them a nonspecific stimulus with our checkpoint blockers. We're just jacking up the immune system and hoping that in the process we may get some autoimmunity. We're also going to get some tumor rejection. So um, T cells express many markers on their surface, many proteins. And most of the therapies, what we call checkpoint blockers, uh, really are designed to modulate those proteins in such a way as to wake up the T cells, to activate them. And uh, those, many of those surface markers evolved, again, as a way to uh, prevent autoimmunity and persistent inflammation, which would be unhealthy. So PD-1 is really sort of the showcase for immunotherapy at this point. It remains the gold standard of treatment in melanoma, although there are many exciting new therapies that are coming down the pike. But 
At this point, for your standard melanoma patient, first-line therapy, we generally say that the patient should get something with PD-1 in it. Uh, PD-1 is used by viruses, tumors, and normal tissues to quiet down the immune system. So it's upregulated in the setting of chronic viral infections. And it seems to be sort of a natural, mechani natural mechanism whereby the body says, look, okay, maybe we don't like this virus, but you know, it's been going on long enough. It seems like it's not killing us. Let's turn and fight something else. So it's, it's, it's really meant to uh, decrease activity of the immune system, and by blocking it, we are able to reactivate T cells. I'll tell you a little bit about another treatment that is in the clinic now, which is very exciting in melanoma, potentially, uh, particularly in combination with such, some of these checkpoint blockades, and really represents a completely distinct mechanism of action. So this is telemagine laherparapvec. It's got a name with a nice ring to it, I guess, but it's a herpes virus, and it was actually originally cultured from somebody's cold sore. That's how it was developed, and then it was um, genetically modified. The nice thing about herpes is you can get it over and over again, which is good for an immunotherapy because the problem with many, many viruses is that what happens is the body just rejects it. So you you can only give it once, and after, the ba after that, the immune system says, I've seen this before, um, you know, and then the treatment is not effective. So this is a virus. Uh, the other advantage with HSV, it's pretty easy to transfect, to move the genes around. So it's been modified so that it's not neurotropic, which was the big concern that it would be neurotropic and cause, that it would be neurotropic and cause, um, you know, encephalitis. That did not happen, so that is, is very important. Also modified so that it selectively infects tumor cells. This is the concept. The concept is that the virus gets injected into the tumor. The tumor is then lysed and releases antigen, and then the immune system sees all of this tumor, this dying tumor in the context of a virus and that can be very immune activating. And then you can get regression of lesions that were not injected, similar in concept in many ways to what is called the abscopal effect, whereby when you radiate a tumor, at times that can be immune stimulatory, and then you can see regression of uh, distant lesions. This is an example of a patient who was treated with TVEC. And this is a patient from my practice who developed extreme vitiligo <laughs> right at the site where his tumor used to be. So demonstrating that it produces an immune response. But of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, only 35% are alive at five years, even with these exciting new therapies, and even in melanoma, which is the best cancer to treat with immunotherapy. So in most cases, we are still failing to cure our patients. So important questions that really are critical to address here are how do we know who will respond and who won't respond? And perhaps most importantly, how do we convert non-responders into responders? And it seems likely that we have not reached the peak of response to immunotherapy because we know that when we had IL-2, which was the first approved treatment for melanoma, only a small percentage responded. And now that we have anti-PD-1, a much higher percentage of patients are responding. So it seems unlikely that the people who are not responding are sort of terminally immune deficient. But probably if we sharpen our tools and develop better methods, we will be able to get more people to respond. So one thing to remember as we seek to understand how immunotherapy works and how we can predict who is going to respond is that immunotherapy causes infiltration of T cells into the tumor. So it, it does seem to work uh, by activating T cells against the cancer. And you can see this is a patient a paper from Rebus's group showing that after treatment, you certainly see an influx of T cells with anti-PD-1.
What they also showed, which is very interesting, is that patients at baseline who have a higher number of T cells in the tumor to begin with, that those patients are more likely to respond. So if you compare samples from patients who did respond to anti-PD-1 to those who don't, you can see that the responders had a head start. So at baseline, they had more T cells in their tumor. They expressed more PDL1, so there was generally more evidence of immune activity within the tumor already. And we can kind of see this on a grosser scale if you compare pancreatic cancer, for example, with melanoma. In melanoma, many tumors will have small evidence of T cells, even if they're completely useless to the patient without treatment, but at least they will have some T cells that are there, whereas in pancreatic cancer, the number of T cells are much smaller, and as we know, pancreas cancer is quite resistant to, at this point, maybe, hopefully not forever, but right now, it's very difficult to treat with immunotherapy. So why is this? And one theory is that this all goes back to immune surveillance. And this is a slide from a review by Sh of the Schreiber Laboratory, who so did some very seminal work in immune surveillance. But basically, the concept is that a tumor grows. So most of us probably have small cancers in our body right now. But what's happening is the immune system, our natural immune system, responds to them, and in most cases, eventually eliminates the tumors. There are some tumors, perhaps, which uh, are able to enter into an equilibrium state with the immune system. So they are maintained in check, but they don't, um, they're not eliminated. And eventually, some of those tumors in the equilibrium state will, through evolution and acquisition of mutations, learn to escape the immune system. And this is a really beautiful experiment, I think, that proves the point. So mice were treated with a topical carcinogen. And then you can see that in the second in panel where the uh, blue lines are, that there are a few mice after treatment with this carcinogen that will develop tumors that will progress to kill the animal. Those are shown in black. But most of the mice in blue will develop these small tumors that then regress. However, if you perturb the immune system of the animal through injection of antibodies um, against uh, CD4, CD8, which are T cell markers and interferon, so you knock out the T cells, most of the animals will then develop progressive tumors. So clearly our body is living in, in symbiosis with tumors, but most of the time we are able to control them. So probably some people have more immunosurveillance left, and those people might be the people who might be responding to immunotherapy, or that, that is one possibility. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some research we did in melanoma looking at prognostic markers, and the hope is that this type of work could then also lead to predictive markers. So the prognostic markers we looked at were looking at immune surveillance and looking at what features of the tumor in immune microenvironment in early stage cancers predicted which ones were going to be more aggressive. And the concept would be that ideally this would then lead to markers that we could also use to predict who is going to respond to immunotherapy. So I'm going to introduce you to the clinical problem of stage 2 to 3 resectable melanoma. So these are patients whose lesions are very small and can easily be removed by one of our surgical colleagues. Now, the thing to remember about melanoma, it's an extremely, so it has a better reputation these days because it's responsive to immunotherapy, but it is an extremely nasty, aggressive, rapidly growing cancer. And one of the theories on that is because uh, melanoma, melanocytes actually originate in a neural crest, so they actually migrate throughout the body during embryogenesis and they seem to have a very migratory phenotype. So you, you can get a tiny tumor, and that tumor can produce cells that will sort of crawl all over the body. So basically, it's, it's pretty frightening. And if you have a tumor uh, that is four millimeters in depth, four millimeters, you pretty much have a 50, before immunotherapy, you had a 50% chance of dying of melanoma in the future. 
So these are the survival curves for different stages of early stage disease. And we wanted to try to, so basically when you see the patient in that setting, you have to kind of tell them, well, there's a 50% chance it could come back and kill you, but we're not sure. So we're gonna scan you every six months, and if it looks like it's starting to kill you, we'll try to do something. So it's not always a great conversation. Um, so we wanted to try to understand a bit more about what was going on in those tumors uh, as far as expression of immune genes. So we use nanostring, and uh, based on an old-fashioned, very old-fashioned literature search with the medical students. But you know, when we started this project, there really was n not much available as far as uh, sequ sequence, well, as far as RNA, mRNA information on these primary melanoma tumors, because they're so tiny that getting the RNA out of them was difficult. They're all formal and fixed. So it's still quite challenging even now to do um, RNA-seq uh, on these, these small tumors, plus the fact that because they're small, the hospital has to look pretty carefully at the whole tumor, because you can imagine, you know, the patient wouldn't like it. It was like there was one piece of the tumor that showed that it was a more advanced stage, but we used that piece for research. So, <laughs> so they feel that they're obligated to look at the whole thing, and so it's very hard to get these samples for research. So we basically looked in the literature for our hypotheses, and we selected about 500 genes uh, that we were going to look at in the tumors to see if uh, patterns were different between patients who uh, went on to progress their tumors uh, returned and caused metastatic disease versus those who did not. And we selected at that point just a whole list of immune genes, some of them T-cell, interferon related, but also some macrophage genes, which at the time were thought to be bad actors, although now I think we know that macrophages kind of can play it both ways. So this is what we found, and this was the original result that was uh, interesting and exciting because usually uh, things don't work. Um, but we found that, so this is the heat map. Each patient is a column. Each row is a gene. So uh, this was the colors I was told was trendy at the time. So you went with the blue and yellow. I had a different color, and my mentor said, no, that's not the colors. So anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yellow, so, so on top, each bar, if it's colored in yellow at the top, it means um, that the patient did not progress, did not develop systemic metastatic disease, and if blue, it means they didn't. And then the higher expression is also shown in yellow. So of course, you know, it's, um, it, there's going to be variability, but it seemed that there was a pattern whereby patients who overall expressed higher patterns of these, uh, these immune genes uh, did not recur. And this was the whole panel as a whole. So uh, then the next step. What is the scale for the mRNA expression? What is the range? There? Well, basically, so this was done using nanostring. So it's basically a quantitative. It's supposed to tell you the absolute number of transcripts, although. I know, but what scale? So it's minus I think that it's, all, it's relative to the median, to the mean, or the median. I have to ask the the statistician guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why I need you people to help me more. <laughs> so we also looked at immunohistochemistry to, um, to check to see that what we were seeing in the RNA wasn't a fluke, that it actually matched with immunohistochemistry as far as gene expression. And generally it did. So if you saw a high number of transcripts for CD3, we also saw a higher number of CD3 cells. And then it sort of became interesting to try to figure out out of that mishmash of about 500 genes, which ones were the most predictive. And so with the help of Eric Schott's group, I was at Sinai at the time, we, we looked at these genes and uh, they did iter iterative approaches to determine which genes uh, correlated most closely with the favorable phenotype. And so using bootstrapping, uh, they repeat it 10,000 times, and the genes which came up most often are shown at the top. And so the genes that came out at the top were mostly uh, related to T cells and to uh, interferon type signaling. CD2, which I believe was also looked at by Nina Bardwaj, uh, came out uh, as at the top. It's a marker of uh, natural killer cells and T cells, also HLAE. NKG2D, so immunosurveillance-related genes. Interestingly, 
I had put in a fair number of macrophage genes thinking they might have an adverse effect, but they didn't seem significant at all. So it seemed like those genes didn't matter, but the genes that did matter were the T-cell related, interferon related, Th1 related genes. So it correlated with overall survival. We made, so basically we used this gene to make a 53 immune gene panel. So out of our original 500 genes, uh, we selected 53 that predicted uh, most accurately. So we tried to remove some of the redundant ones and some of the ones that were not predictive. And it correlated, of course, very well with survival in the training set. Then, through the kindness of colleagues at NYU, we were able to get another set of patients. So crudely, we found the same thing, right? You can see, again, uh, there are clearly probably factors besides the immune system that contribute to tumor progression. But in general, if you ha you'd probably rather have higher expression of these genes um, if you want to be one of the yellow columns that does not progress. We did an AUC curve on the validation set. So it went from, I think, 0.92 to 0.78, so we lost some accuracy, but it's still uh, predicted. And then what we did is we looked in geo for primary melanoma tumor data we could find. And what was interesting is, and by this time, a couple years had passed because it took a long time to get all the work done in the first part, and we found there was more primary melanoma whole genome expression data available publicly than there had been previously. And we, f we looked at about 40 melanoma samples, and we mapped our genes onto the gene expression patterns that were reported. And what was interesting is we found that out of our 53 genes, 42 of them appeared to be part of the same network of genes that went up and down together. And uh, so it's possible that we sort of bit a piece over a lar off of a larger gene network that may be going up and down in these tumors and that may have implications for how our patients do and whether or not the tumors progress. So we did network analysis to define, uh, within using those gene sets to define uh, genes that were closely linked with our uh, R53 genes, and we then analyzed for nodes in the network or uh, genes that appear to be um, most closely uh, related to other genes, so sort of hubs. And we found that the, uh, one of the key nodes was CCR5, which is interesting because CCR5 drives the Th1 phenotype. So uh, overall, the picture is consistent with the fact that you know, a Th1 immune response within the primary melanoma is probably a good thing, which I think has become more and more seen in many tumor types, not just melanoma, that, you know, with the immunoscore and colon cancer, et cetera. So you want to have some Th1 activity inside these melanomas. And I think one of the frustrating things for us in the clinic is I'd like to be able to sit down with the patient and say, good news, your Th1 levels are high, but, you know, I can't do that yet. So that's, I think, a really important task. It would be really great if we could do that for our patients. So another area where we've started working most recently in the lab is looking at multiplex IHC because, you know, when you do nanostring, the nice thing about it is the data is pretty good as far as, you know, you can trust the mRNA levels um, in the sense that because it's a probe-based assay and not PCR, uh, there's less artifact. And for these poor quality RNA samples from clinical tissues, you really get nice numbers. Um, you can pick the genes you're interested in, so you can look at up to 500 genes or 800 genes at once. The downside, of course, to any method such as, such as this is that when you're doing the nanostring, you do grind up the tissue, so you lose the spatial orientation, which could be very important, right? It could be very important. Um, and of course, you don't know which cell type is expressing what. So it's, most of our genes presumably come from infiltrating cells, but um, the spatial aspects are lost. So we've started doing multiplex IHC panel in stage two to three melanoma to see if we layer that on, if that could improve the accuracy of the gene expression. So we have been looking currently in the lab at CD3, CD8, CD4, 
um, several markers. We wanted to include an HLA marker because interestingly in our, in our panel, our nanostring panel, a lot of HLA markers came up at the top as being predictive of good outcomes. And it, it was, we were sort of intrigued to see, I can't remember, I wish I could uh, cite them, but there was this wonderful paper recently showing that HLA-DR expression correlates with response to pd one to anti-PD-1 in melanoma tumors as well. So we included uh, HLA-DR as well as KI-67, which has been postulated by uh, Rebus and others to, uh, you know, that KI-67 being a marker of cell division, that if you have dividing T cells in the tumor, that's a particularly good thing. So this is a project that's ongoing in the lab where we're, we're staining these primary melanomas uh, to analyze them this way. So we're using SOX10 as our tumor marker for melanoma. And this is to see that with this technology that we're using, it's a vector machine from Perkin Elmer. They didn't, pay, they're not paying me at the moment. So, but, <laughs> but you can look at a pathology view uh, so that, you know, your pathologist can look at it and they're, they're sort of, they like that. So you can take a pathology view, but you can also look at a fluorescent view. So this is showing the layering on of the different markers that we're staining right now. And you can get a pretty good picture of, of co-expression of different markers. And I can't really see, oh, here I am. Okay, so basically um, you, what you can do is then you can, after you're done staining, you sort of assign each tumor a dot based on its phenotype and what it expresses. And so you can essentially end up with a spreadsheet where in the whole slide you can have a spreadsheet where each row is, is a cell. Within the, within the tumor. And so each row will contain what it's stained for out of your six markers, uh, whether it's positive or negative, whether the staining is nuclear or cytoplasmic, and its geographical location, sort of XY coordinates within the tumor as far as where it's located. So once you've sort of taken out the picture, this is, this is what it would look like, through a dot representing a cell of each phenotype. And you basically go through two steps. The first step is that you teach the computer what is stroma and what is tumor, and we use the SOX10 staining as well as morphology. Everything still has to be looked at once by a pathologist. Um, but we, we separate it into tumor and stroma, and then we go through and decide what types of cells we're looking for, and we tell the computer, you know, so we're looking for cells that are CD3, CD8 positive, um, and then you have to set the intensities, and it's a bit like flow cytometry in that you do have to worry about spectral overlap and all of that. But you can also do something called nearest neighbor analysis where you can test, you know, how close the cells are to each other. So how close is a CD8 T cell? What is the closest antigen-presenting cell to that uh, T cell? And you can uh, get the distance. And one really fascinating question that we're just starting to think about is how do we know what distance means? So does that mean the cells are touching? You know, we, we don't really know, but that, that's, that would all sort of be sort of interesting questions to explore as far as, you know, what types of spatial orientations are associated with cellular communication. And this is sort of our early, we just analyzed about our first 30 samples, and we looked at HLA-DR expression and KI-67 expression. And what was interesting is we found in the first panel on the right, uh, CD8 positive T cells get significantly closer to macrophages if those macrophages express HLA-DR. So if, if the macrophages not express HLA-DR, they tend to stay away from it, but there's something about the macrophages, we don't know exactly, but the myeloid cells, so they're CD68 positive cells. If they express HLA-DR, which is an antigen presenting marker, a marker that allows them to interact with T cells, then they will draw the T cells in closer to them. We also found that uh, this effect was also true for tumor, so if the tu which is really interesting, and this is one of the interesting puzzles of melanoma. Why would a melanoma cell want to express HLA-DR? I have no idea. But it does seem, it's been reported by many groups, and we've found it also that the melanoma cells, for some reason, are expressing this HLA-DR, which is essentially a marker that is designed to activate the immune system. And we don't really understand it. But anyway, um, if, if the tumor cell is expressing that marker, it also draws in the T cells. On the opposite side, if the tumor cell is dividing, it will push the T cells away. And this makes a lot of sense because we know there is generally 
an inverse relationship between mitotic rate, which is prognostic, and the number of infiltrating T cells. So these are sort of the early findings from the first 30 patients we analyzed. We also, uh, in very, very small numbers, so it's hard to know for sure, but we looked uh, here at uh, the mean distance of the CD3, CD8 positive T cells to the CD68 positive macrophages and the SOX10 positive tumor cells. And we found that the T cells in the uh, non-recurrent patients did appear to be closer to the HLA-DR expressing tumor cells. And they did appear, for whatever reasons, to be further from the non-HLA-DR expressing CDA-positive myeloid cells. And so this is preliminary. We have to break this down by patient by patient, because right now it's just a total number of interactions across everything. But this is the type of analysis, and, and I'm presenting this kind of preliminary data because it's, it's quantitative, and we could certainly use some collaborations on this end as far as trying to uh, process all of this data. So this is just a final picture showing uh, a tumor that has pretty much kicked out most of the CD8 T cells shown in magenta to the side of the tumor. So it's, it's, uh, it's showing how it's excluding the T cells. And I want to thank all of uh, the people who have really worked uh, hard with me on these projects, all of the students and clinical fellows in my lab. Robin Gartrell is, is uh, my postdoc and uh, all of the collaborators, a wonderful team in melanoma at Columbia with Gary Schwartz, Richard Carvajal, and uh, great working with uh, Susan Page. Um, I guess, so I can ask the first question while we're getting you the microphone. So how much mechanistically is understood? I mean, for example, you mentioned that PD-1 uh, blockade will give rise to larger infiltration. Why? How does that work at a biology level? What, is it, is it uh, ability to move more effectively if they're more active? Is it is chemical signaling? What, what, how does that work? Is, Sure. But and, and sort of it turns down the activation pathway as far as uh, motility. But so, so it affects how motile they are, how fast they, how much they can get through some complicated network of fibers or whatever. Right. And how much cytokine they secrete and all that. I mean, that's a very general answer, but I certainly think there's room for more specifics here. Yeah. Unless maybe someone else knows something. Well, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, what was, what was the comment? I didn't. Proliferate. Proliferate, yeah. Well, but it's also a question, I mean, there's proliferation, but I mean, I've seen many pictures like your last one where there's this large proliferation of T cells surrounding some tumor and they don't seem to go in or they just barely make it in. And so that's, it may not be just proliferation. Right. And there could, could be back signaling to the pd one yeah. you know, as far as okay. So they're just less active. So there's a, so there, so it's a, a motility factor, basically. It's a, among other things, yeah. Okay, that's okay. They just stop moving. Okay, thank you. saying that um, people have looked at the epigenetics of exhausted T cells and certainly um, there are changes, you know, in the whole pattern of gene expression that might modulate multiple pathways such as motility and proliferation. So just, just quickly, probably I was <coughs> out and you mentioned that, but so currently to do the gene panel, the expression mm -hmm. panel, I mean, is it uh, what do you guys use, like specific gene chips? I mean, F FE or what do you like? Well, that's what I was explaining is for us, and I think it is possible on these primary melanoma tumors to do RNA-seq, but not on every tumor and it's difficult. The chips, I know there are these special chips that are for degraded RNA may also work. We've used nanostring and we found that the nanostring, you know, was relatively 
uh, you know, worked relatively well in, in, in tissues that had pretty poor RNA. Right, yeah. right. And the second question, you, uh, there, were, um, there were a couple of slides about how exactly you visualize, mm -hmm. like there's this multidimensional space with essentially a position, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. and maybe, you know, ideally see some clustering. Yeah. Uh, and you commented that there was no clear uh, idea what distance was at that point. Have you guys tried to do like um, principal component one, two, and just see how that might have? We would love to. We've just, we're just now in my lab, they're just collating the data. We have about 190 oh. samples. So once we have that all together, then we would love to find a collaborator to do that with. Because so. I also <laughs> want to point something. There is a, um, it's actually a product, I think, at this point in time. There's something called Concordia out of Harvard's new newly minted Department of Biomedical mm -hmm. Informatics. So they do exactly with that. And actually, very interestingly, even you know, when you just put uh, PC1, PC2, things absolutely cluster, mm -hmm. even you know, according to tissue of origin, et cetera. So there might be something you want to look yeah, at definitely. when the data is right. complete. Thank you. Uh, no, not to beat the dead horse again on the minutia, but uh, any of the data that you get there, especially to Herbie's question, um, if you're able to give some of that data over, as on the White House side, we've been informed there's about 13 different PDL1, PD1 type targets coming online. So that level of questioning that Herbie just mentioned on how much movement, what kind of movement, I think maybe those little differences will hopefully be ways that you could think about these different uh, ways that the immune system is responding. Right. So if you have data sets and things that you're able to share and provide, uh, I think we're gonna continue to build those atlases for this community. Great, because I think there's definitely, personally, and maybe other people have known more than I have, but I don't think we fully understand which aspects of the impact of PD-1 on the T cell are most important. I've got a question on CD40 cells. Um, you saw um, a lot of MHC class two on your tumor yeah. cells. Um, have you got a sense of what antigens are being pr presented and, and the role of, of, of that processing system on the tumor cells? I mean, could this be something to engage regulatory T cells or even CD8 T cells? Because there is some data su suggesting CD8 T cells could be MHC class two restricted sometimes. I definitely, I mean, we're working with formalin fixed samples, so, you, you know, at this point, we really don't know what is being uh, presented on there, but it's interesting that it was reported that expression of this uh, HLA-DR does predict response to PD-1, so that is interesting, yeah. Uh, <coughs> You know, if you're interested in spatial information, and as Herbie said, you know, we're clearly interested in movement, but would it be possible to get tumor explants and then do two-photon microscopy to actually <laughs> film over, you know, limited periods uh, how the T cells are actually interacting with melanoma cells? And uh, I think one of the barriers to doing that has been, you know, that most of the, I guess if you could get an explant that was alive, I, I don't know, that's not what my lab does, but the other aspect is, you know, moving into humanized mice to do those types of experiments, I think would be a great I, way I, to I know we're, t we're trying to collaborate with a group to do that on breast cancer, to try to create, you know, to try to basically co culture out of an explant T cells and macrophages and tumor cells and see if one, one can actually discover some of these rules of motion, but it's, it's not there yet. <laughs> But you also don't have the culture out of them. I mean, you could actually, you know, inf inf I presume you can do things like infuse antibodies to label specific subtypes of cells oh, yeah, and sure. actually watch yeah. oh, the yeah, movement in the intact explant. When, yeah, I mean, when I worked in Alan's lab, Alan Houghton, he did that in mice with mouse tumors. Yeah. And I'm thinking that if we could make a great humanized mouse model with a patient who responded, that would be awesome. But I haven't right. seen anyone do that yet. Yeah. Sounds like a great approach. Yeah. Any other questions or general comments? Everybody wants coffee and taking a break? We're not, we're not late, we're, we're 10 minutes late. Yeah, so we're 10 minutes, well, but we're, well, we've been having the discussion, just in, in uh, well, I want to declare that the discussion we've been having super, you know, included that discussion section, because otherwise we're gonna be very late. <laughs> 
Okay. So that's why I asked, does anybody have any general issues one wants to bring up for all any of the three talks or, or more generally? Um, I mean, I had a question, I guess, uh, in the context of the, with the last talk, uh, which was, it, it, I mean, at least in the, in the press, there is some uh, talk about this sort of viral approach. I guess it's called oncolytic viral therapy, uh, which is sort of using virus to attack the T cells to then create more information, in some sense, for the immune system. Is that, is that sort of... Uh, well, I, I guess you were the only one who showed something like that, which was what I guess in, in the, in the uh, open press seems to be called oncolytic viral therapy, where you give, where you give viruses that then attack the, the cancer specifically because of the way, they're just, the way they're engineered, and then that presents, somehow tries to present more information to the immune system. So is that, has that just not progressed this far in general? So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Virus, and uh, this is actually a topic I am very excited about, so I'm happy to talk about it. Um, but basically, so the only FDA approved virus right now, there probably will be others in the future, is, is this TVEC. And TVEC was approved based on phase three data showing, um, I think they they neared overall survival. The p-value was 0.051 or something like that, but they did meet their primary endpoints related to response, and you have to remember that many of these patients are going on to other treatments, like anti-PD-1 and IPI afterwards. But um, basically, it, it was approved for melanoma as a single agent, and now what's going on currently is that it is being tested in combination both with anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. The response rates to the combination of TVAC plus uh, anti-CTLA-4 uh, anti are close to 50%, uh, very high, which is much higher than you see with anti-CTLA-4 alone. So I think it's exciting because it's a completely different mechanism. And so, you know, by combining it, you might really be able to get some good outcomes. Currently, the other aspect which I didn't present due to time constraints, but we are working with TVEC in the lab in mice, and we are trying to understand the dynamics of what happens there as far as both RNA expression and IHC in our mouse model uh, with the TVEC injections. But I, I think it's it's important because it's 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 a pathogen and you know immunotherapy began with pathogens and our and our body evolutionarily is designed to attack pathogens so i think having a live virus is a nice thing there's a number of cnn there will also be reports about gdm i guess being treated with polio virus right mm -hmm. so those are very few patients i guess those are very few patients that's earlier in development the tvac has been treated with hundreds of patients it's actually fda approved i actually give it every week in my clinic and uh, you, you know so so it's more advanced uh, al along the way, yeah. You're using it in clinic. Have you ever seen a distant visceral response with TVAC? How often does that happen? So, yes, I have seen that. And what's interesting to me is I think it's a bulk question. So I think if you have a bulky metastasis that's visceral, it will never respond to TVAC alone. But the first thing that makes that convinces me personally that there is quite a significant systemic effect is that I've treated patients with TVAC. Now, bear in mind that once we start combining with PD-1, CTLA-4, all this sort of becomes less clear and also perhaps less important because it might be a good booster just to the CTLA-4 and PD-1. But I've had patients, the typical patient who responds great to TVAC is a patient who has a lot of bulky skin lesions you can inject and not much visceral lesions. I think there's a ratio because it's very important when you do the injections to inject the whole tumor. And I think the ratio of where you can get to needle to where you can't get needle is important. But patients, I've had patients who've had, you know, lesions sort of sort of climbing up their leg very ominously. And I just ran into that, you know, it's been four years now since I treated her, she's still alive and well. And I cannot believe that she did not have circulating melanoma cells in her body at that time. So I'm sure that it was active. But beyond that, she also had a lung met, and that, a very small lung met. And that lung met, um, you know, did respond. So I think that, that, but I think it has to be very small volume disease. It certainly is not active against a large liver met on its own. Now in combination with PD-1 and CTLA-4, you know, perhaps. I have a general question, kind of, um, so we see limited right, response from solid tumors, which mm -hmm. are the challenge, but kind of just related to what you just said, um, kind of one interesting thing is immune therapy might work very well against like a micrometastasis, right. which actually is kind of the really, right, what people really care about, but on the other hand, 
would be, because you don't have the bulk tumor, might not be surprised, it's much more accessible. Mm -hmm. and, and they're probably close to the blood vessels, right? But, right. but you know, clinically, that's kind of very important. But on the other hand, clinically, I also think it's very, very, probably very difficult to design any trial against that because kind of how would you evaluate whether immune therapy work well, against micrometastasis? I think, I think in melanoma, we have a, the adjuvant setting is, as I described, about half of people will recur. So it's, you know, you assume that if you give these treatment in the adjuvant setting and then they don't recur, that you've probably hit the micromets. Um, and I guess that coupling with modeling in mice could be a, could yeah, be a way to do but it. But let's say right, we get from for colon cancer, you yeah. know, you resect the primary tumor, right? Uh -huh. But you're always afraid of the, you know, my, my right. metastasis. But to evaluate whether it works, you know, you can, I guess you probably can give one one dosage of cell right. therapy, but you know, it can come back like a couple of years later as well. Yeah, I think it's it's harder to get at. Uh, quantitatively, but I do feel that at the end of the day, what we care about obviously is if the if the patient has viable micromets, they're going to recur clinically. So you just have to look at the rates of clinical recurrence and extrapolate from that that you must have hit the micromets. I think. Okay, I think we're in need of caffeine therapy, so we're, we're going <laughs> to uh, have a break for about 15 minutes or so. 